Hello, everybody. Hey. Ooh, here we go. Oh, bright lights. Hi. So I'm Tamar Baskind, and I am here to talk to you tonight about Emanuel Ringelblum and the archives of the Warsaw Ghetto. The man behind me, Emanuel Ringelblum. One day in 1939, Emanuel Ringelblum realized that he was doomed. More than that, he realized his family, his friends, his entire community were all doomed. He lived in Warsaw, Poland, 1939. Yeah. So a little history. There's maps. In 1939, World, Wars II, World War II was going on. Germany invaded Poland, and among other things, the Germans created ghettos, which were walled neighborhoods in which people, mostly Jews by the end of it, though in the beginning there were also Roma residents and political uh, dissidents and so on. But these people were forced to live, uh, to live inside these neighborhoods in increasingly inhuman conditions. You have the map of uh, the ghetto superimposed on Warsaw at the time. The ghetto in Warsaw stood in what used to be the Jewish district of the town before the war, and Warsaw itself was a prominent center of Jewish culture um, for decades, and community, and theater, and, and newspapers, a lot of things were going on. And after the Germans invaded, because Warsaw was such an important dis, uh, center for Jewish culture, a lot of Jews from the surrounding areas traveled because they thought they'd be safer there than in the country. When the Germans established their government in late September of 1939, they immediately began registering people of ethnic minorities. They also established the, the, Ju the Jewish Council, excuse me, the Unrat, to carry out their orders for the community. They closed a lot of businesses. They conscripted Jews into forced labor. Jews were forced to declare themselves first by wearing these armbands and then later the, the yellow stars that we're familiar with from uh, movies and so on. Um, here we see a boy selling these armbands while wearing an armband. And this was, was a strategy that the Germans had. They also created a Jewish police to help enforce and carry out the rules for them. Back to Ringelblum, that's him with his family, his wife and young son. About this time, when the police, uh, when the Jewish police was established and so on, Ringelblum decided that he needed to do something here. And he wanted a way to, and the quote I found was to cast a stone under history's wheel. He wanted to make it bumpy. He wanted people to notice it. And he wanted to ensure that his story, his family's story, his friends, community, they will all outlive those who were doomed in the ghetto. He knew that they were going to go down. He saw what was coming, and he decided to do something about it. He started recording the life of the community um, and the ghetto in his journal, and soon he convinced others to join in his efforts. And here behind me, you see some of the historians that he worked with. Um, he had about 15 sort of hardcore contributors and archivists and editors and so on, but dozens of people contributed. Samuel Kassa, who wrote the introduction to the book the, uh, based on this, Who Will Write Our History, had this to say about Ringelblum. Even though he knew that most Polish Jews would not survive, Ringelblum continued the Oinig Shabbos, and I'll come back to that. One of his most important goals was to explain for future historians the behavior of the Jewish masses, the Jewish people, during the war. The book came out in 2007. It is fascinating. I'll link it on the something weird. So the group called themselves Oinig Shabbos, or Oinig Shabbat in Hebrew, and this means the joy, the joy of the Sabbath. This goes back to a long tradition in Jewish culture. Saturday afternoons, you gather, you talk, you discuss, you sing, you, you take pleasure in things on Saturday afternoon after the prayers and the studies are done. 
the group used this, used this name uh, as a cover. They would gather on sat Saturday afternoons, and if Germans would come by, they would say, hey, we're just doing what our people have done for, for hundreds of years. Nothing going on here. Like I said, there are about 15 hardcore members. Uh, a lot of them I could not find pictures of, but some of them I did, and I'll tell them here. Uh, so Hirsch Wasser and Bluma Vaso, Rabbi Shimon, Shimon Huberband, Abraham Levin, and Rochel Overbach. The names are really important. We're gonna put a stone under the wheel of history again and mention their names. So in April 1940, construction of the wall uh, began in earnest. You can see here them building. They were uh, blocking the roads. Other uh, people who were not Jews had to leave. Jews who lived in other districts had to move in. And in November, the walls were locked. They were enclosed with very few checkpoints that people could get in and out of. Ringelblum wrote in his journal, the Saturday the ghetto was introduced was terrible. People in the street didn't know it was going to be a closed ghetto, so it came like a thunderbolt. And I wanted to mention this. This was on Saturday, the holy day for Jews. It was a very pointed thing. Why? Because fucking Nazis. <laughs> this is going to come back. You're welcome to join me in shouting this. So the ghetto was closed. The people inside were left without food. Um, this is a food rations card behind me. Um, and it turns out that each person was only allotted 181 calories a day. Let's do the math on that one. There was no formal industry. There was a lot of smuggling. Um, and there were, there were some industries that were not sanctioned but weren't punished either. So there was a lot of sort of black market stuff uh, going on. But a lot of people died, as many as, as 5,000 each month died from starvation and disease and so on. But people in the ghetto organized to help each other as best they could. Um, there, were, uh, there was industry, there was culture. Rochele Avobach, who I mentioned a few minutes ago, helped organize a soup kitchen um, to feed people. People pooled whatever resources they had. This is again from Samuel Kassaw. He said that Ringelblum was absolutely convinced that the story of Jewish suffering, no matter how terrible, was a universal not just a Jewish story, and evil, no matter how great, could not be placed outside of history. His archive, Ringelblum's archive, could become a weapon in the struggle for a better future. The type of work that the archivist did was not sanctioned by any means, but they kept with it. They collected every scrap of paper that they could find, visual art, they solicited interviews, they solicited essays and plays and songs, um, and they got as many people as they could to contribute, and they went over this material every Saturday afternoon, organizing and cataloging. They conducted their work in the building of the Judaic Library uh, building right next door to the Great Synagogue of Warsaw, which is on the screen behind me. And here's an inside view. They collected the items that they archived in metal boxes, tin milk jugs, crates, uh, by the end they were wrapping them in fabric, bundles of fabric, and they buried these in the ground. Um, they collected testimonies, they collected, like I said, all kinds of things, and one of the testimonies um, I thought was really poignant, um, this was created by Nahum Krishvach, Jivach, excuse me, and right before he buried the box that he buried, he, he put another little note in there and he said, I don't know what's going to happen to me. Remember, my name is Nahum Zivach. So we're going to remember him again. In 1942, after a round of murders and deportations, two groups of Jews decided to fight back. They created underground bunkers. They trained guerrilla fighters. Um, they decided to... Uh, you guys might have heard about the Warsaw Uprising or Warsaw Revolt. That's when they started preparing. And it was at this time that the members of Onik Shabbat um, also broadened their shift. They started working with the underground um, movements and collecting testimonies and stories from people outside the ghetto. So they were wanted to create, as uh, to collect, excuse me, as many things as they could. 
they kept collecting, they kept burying uh, artifacts. In late April 1943, just after the last batch was buried, the Nazis started their operation to liquidate the ghetto. It's nice, right? And the troops entered on the eve of Passover. Passover, again, one of the most important Thank you. But they found the streets deserted. They couldn't find the Jews that they wanted to liquidate. Any Jews remaining have gone into hiding. In order to force the Jews out of their bunkers, the Nazis blasted the ghetto. They razed it. They destroyed it to rubble. And as a final fuck you to the Jews, they destroyed the great synagogue. Right. Luckily, the building right next to it, you can see here the pile of rubble and the building right next to it, that's the building where, where the members of Onik Shabbat did their work. And that survived, survived the rubble, the destruction. Many of the members of Onik Shabbat, like everybody else, the roughly 42,000 people who survived the destruction of the ghetto were sent to their deaths in, pr in camps or in prisons. Many of the members of Onik Shabbat died, Emmanuel Ringelblum, one of them, Rabbi Shimon Huberben, one of them, Abraham Levine also, um, a lot of others. But Hirsch and Bluma Vassil survived, and Rochele Avelbach survived. And in 1946, a year after the war ended, they returned to the destroyed ghetto to try and find some of those artifacts, and they succeeded. Behind me, you can see the bringing out of the first box the first tin box, and to that we say. Thank you. In 1950, two more caches were found, and while a lot of the artifacts inside these uh, tins and jugs were, were damaged by the water, a lot were still in good enough shape to read. They contained poems and songs and plays and stories, uh, candy wrappers, flyers for musical performances, whatever they could find. They just grabbed every piece of paper that they could find, um, diary entries and so on. Today, these artifacts, there are 25,000 documents that survived the Ringelblum archive. They're on display today at the Jewish Historical Institute, which is located at the same building where Onik Shabbat <laughs> conducted their work. Yeah. yeah, take that, Nazis. Um, they've been digitized, you can find them online. I'll post links at the, at the Something Weird group. Um, they're amazing works of art, uh, visual and otherwise. They've been memorialized in books, fictional and otherwise. Most recently, a film, which is coming out, it came out in December, I think, who will write our history, which follows um, uh, some of the major characters in Oneg Shabbat. And so, in effect, the artifacts and the stories they contain, the names that they bring back into the light and the voices that they raise once again have indeed outlived the massacres of World War II. They outlived the doom that the archivists themselves suffered. And so, you guys wanna join me? <laughs> Nazis, thank you. Ah, uh, you do me proud, thank you. So I could end with this. Fuck Nazis, because we can't say it too much, but I won't. I would rather go back to the archivists, the artists, the writers who created and collected and wrote and performed and retained their humanity in, in human conditions. I'd like to close with the words of one of the many personal testimonies included in the archive. This one was written by David Grabel in August 1942, and he said, what we were unable to cry and shriek out to the world, we buried in the ground, so that the world may know all. May the treasure fall into good hands. May it last into better times. May it alarm and alert the world to what has happened. We may now die in peace. We fulfilled our mission. May history attest to us. Please join me in raising a glass to these guys to Emmanuel Ringelblum and the members of Oneg Shabbat. Thank you.